Okay, let's begin, I think. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Sound Arts Lecture Series hosted here at London College Communication in association with CRISAP, the Creative Research and the Sound Arts Practice Centre, which is also at LCC. As you know, I'm Mark Peter Wright, the acting course leader for the BA Sound Arts course and member of CRISAP. Um, I'm very, very happy that we have Vicky Brown with us today, um, who's going to be sharing her wonderful work with us all. Um, and I'll introduce Vicky shortly, but as usual, um, I'm going to go through my housekeeping bits. And I'm also, I have like an announcement uh, to make for students in particular that will be uh, useful. So, as always, <clears throat> um, just want to remind everyone that this is a unique space um, consisting of the potential of BA, MA, PhD, and public, which is a wonderful mix. Um, so, if you are a UAL student, sirens everywhere around me. Um, if you are a UAL student, just make sure that your name is full in the username so we can identify you. Particularly if you're an external guest, please put your full uh, name as your username, um, or else we might have to ask you to leave if we can't identify you, which sounds much scarier than it actually is. Um, always remember that this is a public forum. The chat message is archived. Um, microphones are off, I think. Uh, so that's all fine and I just have to say that we are recording the session and that does include the chat messaging as well. For students, uh, BA students, please scan this wonderful QR code for your attendance for today. I'll pop it in the chat as well afterwards if you don't get time to do it. Uh, don't worry. So there it is. The code is N0CT7X. Um, and I'll pop that in the chat afterwards. So a reminder, just always, the Q&A is a wonderful chance to ask um, practitioners and researchers questions. And I'm always keen to stress that a question doesn't have to be overly complex. We can think of just following up a certain part of a project or a bit piece of interest that, that sparked your, your curiosity. So. Don't worry about overly complex questions, although they can be fun as well to try and disentangle. Um, I think we're going to, as always, try and emphasize the chat. Do log your questions and comments in the chat. Um, use it as a kind of a social note taking device, however you feel. Let's try and keep it active. Um, we will gather up the questions and do them at the end of the talk, as, as we usually do. Um, but do, do use that space to, to think. Um, socially, I suppose, as well. It's quite an interesting um, para, parasite, I will call it. Um, and again, I'll direct message you if you want to ask your question vocally and come on the mic. Um, if not, I'll be moderating and asking questions on your behalf. So just a quick announcement for students and for public, really. The MA Sound Arts Postgraduate Show is happening right now. Um, in London, in Dilston Gallery, in Southwark Park Galleries. Um, there's actually, it's actually open today, so it's free, um, 11 till 6. And I would definitely recommend, there is also a research symposium attached to this on Saturday the 3rd. It's actually online and you can book via the CRISAP website, um, that's for students and public. And it's a great way to actually see what goes on um, in the course. For our BA students, I would really try and get down to the show to see the MA students and see how they're putting work in space. It's um, very, very useful for you. Okay, so why we're here today, Vicky. Um, I'm just gonna very briefly read part of um, Vicky's bio and then I'll just I'll hand over from there, but um, so Vicky is an installation artist who utilizes everyday objects such as Walkmans, iPods, clothing and furniture to comment on Western systems of consumption and network relationships to ecologies. Vicky often manipulates the familiar using traditional craft techniques such as lead like glasswork or weaving, also employing found or produced sound. There's absolutely heaps and heaps of exhibitions and all sorts of um, credits I could list, but maybe um, 
I'll just sort of say that recently Vicky's had a major survey exhibition of her work open at the Blue Mountains Cultural Centre in New South Wales, I believe, um, which I think is has maybe finished now, but I might be wrong about that, but I'm sure Vicky will, will tell us more about that. So I think this is probably a good chance for me to, to stop talking and um, pass over to Vicky and just to say thank you once again. I believe it's one in the morning with you, Vicky. So it is one in the morning. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I am a night owl, so it's not it's not too bad. Um, yeah, I, I'll try not to, to uh, yeah start yawning. Um, thanks, Mark. That was uh, yeah great. All right, so I'm going to just um, start by sharing my screen and. Um, the exhibition that Mark was referring to um, has just finished. So um, it finished about three three weeks ago. Um, yeah, I'll just get rid of my, sorry. I'll just get rid of those floating screens. There we go. Um, I'm actually gonna begin um, just by doing an acknowledgement of country. Uh, which may seem strange for you in the UK, but um, it's really important for us to do an acknowledgement of country um, uh, because of our colonial history um, and the kind of um, contested nature of the land that we're on. So quite often uh, when we uh, do formal lectures um, or talks or any kind of gathering, um, exhibition openings and things will have an acknowledgement to country. Um, so I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on, which is the Gundagara and Darug country. Um, and I want to recognize that the land I'm on was never ceded and that I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, further to that, I think, um, I'm actually a, um, a lecturer and I run the first year program at Sydney College of the Arts, which is part of Sydney University. And um, part of the learning experience is that uh, we really try and build, um, I guess, culturally respectful art, practice, <laughs> art practices. So um, we're trying to always strategize what that means in a, in a kind of um, Australian colonial context. Um, so doing this kind of acknowledgement is really important. Um, uh, yeah, as part of a, a kind of um, way of working as well, it sort of extends into practice. Um, so uh, as Mark was saying, I am a, a, an installation artist. Um, I've been working for I guess about 25 years. I keep saying 25 years, so it's probably a bit longer. Um, but I use a, a range of materials and a range of techniques. So a lot, of, as Mark was saying, craft techniques um, and lots of found um, sound technology. It's always, uh, I always work quite uh, lo-fi and um, often uh, analog and um, very hands-on. And so um, it's a very sort of studio-based, practice-led um, way of making art. Uh, but um, sound, I don't always work with sound, but sound is a really important tool and feature and material that's uh, in my practice. Um, and those are the works, the, the sound works that I've made are the ones that I'll be speaking to today. Um, I think as a broad brushstroke, what I'm interested in trying to do in my work is um, sort of interrogate or um, it's all about experience and it's all about lead, the materials leading us to think about how we experience the world or how we're sort of interconnected into maybe ecologies or the way we move through the world is kind of marked by material so in terms of sound i always think of sound as um as being this is going to sound odd but as much in the dirt as it is in the air because it's how we um how we really understand materials is embedded 
um, well, a large part of it is how we understand their sound. So it's part of our way of making meaning through the world. So that's sort of another reason why I like using sound as a, as a kind of material to work with. Um, this talk I'm going to do is, I've never, I've never done this before. Usually I sort of, I don't know, talk to themes or lenses, but I'm actually going to go right back um, to when I first discovered um, working with sound. Um, and the reason why I thought I'd start from sort of the very beginning um, and work forward is because I have had this kind of major exhibition, which I don't want to call it a retrospective, um, although it does have um, old and new works um, in the show, but I've actually remade all the old works so they are more integrated with the new works and um, which you'll see later, but I thought it makes sense to sort of start from the beginning since I've got that um, lot show with longevity in it. Um, so this, uh, yeah, 1997 <laughs> is going right back to when I was at art school um, and I was studying sculpture. This is probably, I think, my second year um, and I was really into making furniture and was sort of sculptural furniture. Um, you can see how old it is because this is a 35 millimeter um, slide image um, film. So before digital cameras, uh, we had to document everything with um, 35 millimeter cameras. Um, and I was making these kind of hanging um, or kinetic moving furniture pieces. Um, lots of them were uh, kind of weighted so they would uh, rock back and forth or um, you could um, interact with them um, so sort of sculptural furniture um, so i was sort of i guess um, spent quite a lot of time um, you know learning sculptural techniques so um, working with wood um, bending wood um, welding uh, fabric, metal fabrications, things like that. So it was a really um, hands-on kind of studio practice. And it's interesting to look at these. I mean, I sort of dug them out of an old sketchbook um, yeah, a couple of days ago, and it was really interesting to think how I'm still sort of working in this domestic uh, sphere. Um, so things are sort of still resonating uh, with me with these works. Um, but I found sound um, through, um, we had a, a professor, Nigel Hellier, who was, um, he, he did sort of large scale sound installations um, uh, and uh, public artwork. And he managed to get us some airtime on a radio show, um, on a, a student radio station called 2SER and it started it you can see on our flyer that we've made here um, which is probably from about 2000 and uh, uh, 1998 um, or around that time it's an early show but 1 1 a.m to 3 a.m so as you can see I'm quite used to being up at 1 a.m to 3 a.m um, and we the rate we, we got given this airtime Tuesday night graveyard shift and we did manage to do it for a, you know quite a number of years um, but what we were interested in doing with the radio show um, was sort of document the world around us so we would make multiple recordings you see on with Marantz's on cassette tape um, and then we would sometimes we would um, modify instruments or uh, we would make funny sort of noise machines and we would bring them into the radio station. Um, we'd work to a theme. So you could see that this theme is on a matter pair and C, um, which I have no idea really what, um, but they you know, were quite playful themes. Uh, and we would all turn up with bits of audio and then live mix them. Um, so there were some quite, um, unusual um, ex shows um, and I, I didn't have any, you'll see later why, but I, I don't have any um, actual recordings of 
um, the shows left that I did, um, but I managed to find, find this on Bandcamp, which was the last year um, of Radio Alice, um, 2004. And it's interesting seeing these three names because I know Matt Earl is, is um, a really prolific sound artist still, and same with Anthony Megan. So they're, it's interesting that they're still um, making, making sound and working in this area. Um, incidentally, the name Radio Alice um, comes from an experimental radio show that was in the 1970s in Bologna. Uh, we sort of poached the name, but um, I guess we, we were paying homage to them. Um, so it was an experimental radio show that um, that they were taking um, kind of ideas from the situationists and um, sort of Dada and um, pushing the boundaries of, of what is usually on air. Um, and that's exactly what we were interested in doing. Um, the Italian Radio Alice was much more militant um, and in sort of political activism than we, we were interested in. But um, the sort of, um, I guess the experimental spirit of that is what we were um, sort of interested in emulating. So I thought I'd just play part of this track. It starts off quite quiet. One of the things I guess I want you to think about when I'm playing this track is um, that uh, it's on radio. So you can uh, imagine it coming out of a radio because, um, for instance, we loved playing with this idea of dead air because it's a completely uh, a no-no in radio world. In fact, um, if there was dead air for more than 30 seconds, um, this light would start beeping and um, we would get in quite a lot of trouble. So there was sort of um, interesting <laughs> playing with what is a signal and what is not. And we were also playing around with um, things like static noises. And this this recording's full of static. Um, so if you, you would be mistaken for maybe missing the station <laughs> if, um, if you were listening to it. So we were really sort of playing around with the format of radio. I'll just play it.
I'll just sorry leave it there um, but you can find it on Bandcamp um, it, it's better we can turn it up and have headphones on but um, they the idea of it being sort of subtle and I guess kind of trying to um, work out whether it's a signal or whether it's not and also speaking to um, glitch which is you know if you look at the time that um, that we were on from I think 2000 and uh, 1998 to 2004 it was that at this kind of height of when um, you know this shift from um, from analog to digital and there was a very much um, both um, methods were coming in and we were sort of mashing um, kind of ways of working and really interested in sort of breaking machines or um, kind of um, disrupting sound um, through it. So it was it was a really interesting time, I think, to be making experimental um, music because of the technologies that were coming through. Um, so things like um, we were building uh, PCs um, with uh, sort of, I guess, working with gaming technology because trying to because they had the best sound cards, um, and so we'd sort of had these these funny computers and uh, cracked uh, versions of Pro Tools, but then we'd also have things like real to real machines um, and you know kind of older technologies um, at the same time. So it was really a fun. Um, experimental space um, and that kind of led us to do a lot of um, live performance um, so the waters music festival was a festival that would happen um, every two years um, you might recognize Oren and Barchi um, he's a really fabulous um, sound artist um, so they were running these kind of festivals that um, so radio artists would sort of spill out to that um, the problem was for me is that I just um, didn't like performing live. I was fine on radio, but it wasn't, um, yeah, it wasn't something that I enjoyed. So um, I sort of um, finished up my third year at art school and wanted a break from studying and was trying to work out what where I wanted to take, um, you know, working with sound, but not necessarily um, doing straight recording and performances so I started um, thinking about or thinking more about sculpt my sculptural practice um, and bringing some of the ideas from um, what I've made previously um, into thinking about sound um, so I started doing these kind of um, small artworks where I would use um, turntables and technology and sort of um, mash them with um, sort of craft crafted uh, objects and craft techniques um, so if you look at a work like this I'm sorry I, I haven't got captions but I'll, I'll just speak to them um, so this work was probably around um, 2005 um, and if you'd asked uh, you know a classroom of um, university students if they had used a turntable at that time um, probably very few of them have if you ask the same question now um, quite a few people have um, you know because of the way that um, you know the the history of the turntable is in, in a lot of media is not you know uh, linear so um, you know people are using uh, these kind of the history I was interested in the history of those objects and kind of um, I guess playing with the story of them so you know by wrapping um, wrapping a turntable in this way using um, boxes move removal boxes kind of spoke to that um, or the technology so I was really kind of uh, interested in um, the devices that we were using um, every day to kind of uh, listen to sound so the iPod was such a, um, a, a, a huge kind of um, invention, I guess, in, at that time, and that idea for of things getting smaller and package, packaged, uh, uh, 
interested me or this sort of industry. Um, so you're playing around with, um, you know, putting things sort of re, I guess, repositioning the materials to make us kind of think about um, the way that we're using or uh, using technology or sound technology. Um, this is um, this is actually two remakes. Um, I quite often use um, modify CD players in in this way. So I sort of um, burn a hole in the top and then have a stick going around. So as the as the CD is playing, it's hitting the bell, which then of course disrupts the CD um, player. It's like a manual glitch. Um, and depending on what CD you're playing, you you end up telling a kind of different story uh, within the work. Um, I think recently I've been playing um, The Sound of Cosmic Noise um, from the 19, um, uh, early 60s recordings um, of um, deep space microwaves. Um, so kind of that idea of, um, uh, I don't know, disrupting this larger thing also speaks to connections between it. Um, this work on the right is um, made from, I had a flood and all my Radio Alice tapes that I had got um, flooded and um, so I dried them out and I made a sculpture with all the cassette tapes um, and it's actually got a motor in it so it's slowly, it's sort of shaking. Um, if it, it kind of and it, it makes a sort of rustling sound. I think I've got the, the CD here on a little loop. Um, so I like doing these kind of little interventions. Sorry about this image. It's this is when a digital photo <laughs> photographs came in and compared to the quality of the beautiful 35 millimeter film um, this is this was high uh, technology i think it was like four megabyte as um for, per file um but this is kind of what um a 2005 show would have looked like um so there's a series of um uh, little transistor radios in each one would be doing something slightly different. I think there's one that's run um, by using an Apple, uh, powered by an Apple. Um, there's two here talking to each other and I got into really making like little um, transmitters. So um, I would transmit um, on, um, you know, build little transmitters where I could uh, take a sound say from a looped CD and I could transmit it onto a um, an FM station frequency so you could have um, the sound coming out of the transistor radio so it had that sound quality to it um, but it was um, yeah played within the gallery somewhere else um, we actually we we was we made them we had these um, builders next door to us um, and they would play this really annoying um, commercial radio station and so we get our transmitters out on our flat and um, log into their <laughs> transistor radio and switch their stations around um, so they're quite fun things to they're not hard to build and they're quite fun to play with if anyone's interested um, but then on the back wall um, there's three turntables um, and the shiny things on the wall are, um, I work a lot with um, uh, someone called Peter King of King Records in New Zealand and he has a, um, a lathe cut um, record, play, uh, record machine so um, it's like a hand cut lathe so um, he doesn't even have an email address, it's quite wonderful, you just ring him up and then you send him a CD and then he'll lathe cut it um, for you onto um, usually onto polycarbonate um, perspex um, but I went and um, stayed with him and um, got to experiment on his lathe cut machines and discovered that you could um, cut into all sorts cut records into all sorts of surfaces um, like uh, copper for instance so this is a copper um, a record um, you could also um, cut into CDs, so you could turn a CD into a record, which I um, loved kind of 
playing with. I can show you later. But um, so I would set up these kind of little, I guess, sound stations um, in the gallery um, or sound, little sound interventions. Um, but really sort of manipulating and thinking about, um, you know, the very lo-fi domestic materials that were ways we consume um, sound. Um, so this is another kind of example, and I put this in because it has um, lots of those little processes in. Uh, this work was co called um, Turning Silver and Gold into Rubber and Glue, and it was, um, uh, I think, in around 2006. Um, so if we look at uh, the gold work, um, you can see um, behind the turntable there's a, a, a Walkman that's been sort of there's a stick coming off it and it's as it spins round it hits the um the arm of the turntable which would then skip it which was then playing a record which was probably a recording of the uh end of a record um so it's sort of skipping across that i don't know it looks like there's another walkman behind it but i can't remember about what that was doing and then the silver one this is a the cd um that's been modified so the cd is turned being turned into a record player so that sort of i don't know switching around and making us think i think the um the recording that i put on there was probably from memory the the sound of a cd skipping so there's a sort of strange looping going on in the work um that's sort of repositioning what you're listening to um and sort of i guess it's a sort of critiquing the machine itself um, as we're doing that. Um, so I sort of um, was making these, um, these sort of quite, I guess, um, lo-fi, very domestic um, uh, machine, machine-like um, uh, interventions. Um, and it's really, I guess, based on studio practice. So I had it as I was lucky enough to have a studio um, space. And it was really about um, finding a lots of um, things in in kind of um, secondhand shops or people would give me people still give me, um, I'll open up the mailbox and it'll have like a um, yeah, like a discman or something in it. Um, so because uh, I live in a quite a small community. So if anyone finds or doesn't want um, old sound equipment, they usually leave it on the porch or in my um, mailbox, which is quite handy. Um, but it's just that kind of idea of playing with the everyday. This this work, which you'll see I've remade twice now, but this was my studio muck around. It was like I had these funny stools that I made for my for earlier furniture work and I was like oh what would happen if I put a turntable on top and counterweighted it so as it spun round um, it would make push the needle um, across the the surface of the record like an endless scratching machine um, so just really simple kind of ideas I mean there's a sort of I guess a sort of dumb sense of humor in them but um they they sort of end up getting developed out um into slightly more resolved works um incidentally this work is called man machine and it's playing craft work so it's um uh sort of playing on that that idea of electronic loops but it also speaks to the the record player itself as a kind of material um, and then again, another modified work, sort of, I guess, going further back and thinking about that idea of acting and making a craft um, with this spinning wheel that's been kind of converted into a turntable. Um, that's the record on this one was, um, I went and recorded a whole lot of a spinning circle um, of um, older women um, and kind of uh, remade that. Um, so we'll return to this work because I ended up um, motorizing it for the um, the latest show that I was in. So making these kind of, I don't know, refined these objects um, 
but I, I suddenly, oh, there's another one, sorry, forgot that was there, that was, um, this one was a tree stump that I dug out of a friend's um, uh, paddock and um, turned it into a turntable. The, the interesting thing about this work is, um, and I guess it's a sort of a working strategy um, that I use, is um, quite often works that I make don't necessarily sound the way you think they will sound so um i guess with wood there is a really um you know that you have an idea of what that, that's that kind of sounds like when you drum your fingers on a on some wood so it's kind of interesting because when you spin that one um it sounds like a car crash it's just a, the most awful um sort of metallic screechy sound um, so I also like that idea of kind of playing with expectations around how we think we know um, no sound. So I was making these smaller interactive sort of little sculptures, but um, I sort of was thinking, um, what would, you know, how could I make more of a, I, I guess, like a sound ecology or a, or a networked, um, sound more like an installation work and I wanted to make um, make it so when you walked into the gallery there was a sort of cacophony of sound and then you could walk through it um, and at this time which is probably around 2010 a bit flaky um, I also moved to where I'm living now which is in the Blue Mountains um, which is two hours west of Sydney and it's a world heritage area so it's it's surrounded by a lot of bush and i do a lot of hiking so um i think that i was sort of influenced in that way around this the surroundings and sort of going into the bush and hearing yeah a cacophony of sound um so i wanted to sort of um tra yeah translate that somehow so this work is called um the sound forest um and um, it, as it, it's sort of a class, I, there's these little clusters of works, um, each kind of making sound, um, but then, you know, kind of, they're still in these little um, pods. Um, the things on the walls are, um, they're made the same technique as lead light windowing, but they're made with um, plywood. And they they're just covering windows because um, I wanted to make the the um, the space really dark. So using kind of natural materials um, and ceramics, um, just hand ha simple hand built ceramics. Um, and as the as the work turns, um, it it hits the chimes. These are some more of the records I made in New Zealand and. Um, these ones all have bird recordings on that I made while I was hiking. Um, still using reel to reels and um, and uh, yeah, very found technology. Um, so I was doing this kind of stuff, and um, then um, I have a friend Caleb Kelly who writes extensively about sound. These are some of his books. Um, the Cracked Media book is really great. Actually, it's, it sort of came out of his PhD. Um, I'm not quite sure the date. I think 2008, maybe. Um, but we, uh, he, he came to um, that the Sound Forest show, and he had an idea of um, curating a. a um, exhibition called Material Sound um, with, um, there were six of us um, in that show and um, he wanted to really sort of investigate, I guess, the this idea of um, how sound is sort of embedded in materials and how, um, I guess, there's this sort of material turn that was happening um, around that time um, away from working in a digital sense and um you know a lot of people turning to this kind of really material way of working i think it it kind of makes sense um because of you know this idea of 
I guess the, the post digital being in this kind of post digital age where where um, sound technologies or technologies in general are so embedded in our lives that um, it's not a wonder that we're sort of because I think media in itself is becoming more material. Um, so I think and also the idea of that we're living in our our own demise at the moment. Um, I think that material turn makes sense in that context um so i ended up making um a sort of more expanded version of the sound forest and um this work is called cosmic noise um and it has a lot of recordings um from deep space um embedded into um the turntables and into the seat there's a couple of cd players um but they're also hitting these um, sort of crafted chimes. There's also works that don't make sound, but they're um, they're kind of soundful. Um, I'll come back to that one. But um, so a work like this middle piece and a glass piece where it's made with lead light windows, it's sort of referencing, um, you know, um, planet planetary moons and um but at the same time um you can imagine the chimes but it doesn't actually make any sound um and some of them are interactive they're actually quite disappointing like they make like they, they have no resonance at, at all <laughs> and they, they're kind of um you hit them and they're very dull thud um which is um kind of i quite like um so I'm just going to play a video where uh, Caleb's talking about the uh, about the show because um, I think he's he's quite good at that, and I think a lot of the themes that he is talking about are really um, sort of embedded in my work and in my practice. Um, if you get bored, you can always look at his book collection because it's quite nice behind him. Material sound started with a investigation into sound as more than just sound itself. So thinking about the materials that make sound, where those materials came from, where they might go to in the future, and thinking about the way that sound might help us learn about those materials in a way that looking at them doesn't. So the show itself came from a series of research projects I did again looking at materials and what had had what had been happening is I'd been noticing Australian artists were working less and less with digital techniques so in the zeros there's lots of laptops and computers and digital music especially in the experimental scene and then around I'm thinking around 2010 artists started completely giving away giving away the digital um, they started making their own instruments. Not that this was the first time it had ever happened, but concertedly making their own instruments, not using digital practices, um, modular synthesis, um, collecting sounds and so on. And making sounds out of real materials. So when I say real materials, I mean not digital, not formed in the digital studio, not formed through speakers, but formed through actual things hitting other things. Um, and then if there was electronics, often handmade electronics. So this is a thing that happened in Australia. Um, and I was thinking why this happened and what does it mean? And what, what can we learn by thinking about this type of practice? One of the things we learn is that the digital is very hands-off. You can't touch the inside of your laptop. You can't hold your materials. Um, and for most people, you don't even know how it actually works, how that laptop works. Um, artists felt like they were removed from their own practice. And so a group of artists started taking back their practice by making everything themselves and being able to literally hold their work again. So I was looking at that and then thinking about what those materials are that they're using. A lot of these artists have an ecological element to their work, an ecological practice. They're thinking about where they came, where the materials came from. Um, they're thinking about if they're using wood, they're thinking about the forests that they came from. Um, they're thinking about solar power, 
they're thinking about um, where things end up in e-waste and um, they're thinking about what it means to make make the components yourself. So this show differs from many shows in that it is um, an exhibition in an art gallery that is primarily focused on sound. So there is plenty to look at. Um, there's installation, there's movement, and there's interaction. Um, but what we're doing in the show is listening to the exhibition. So the artists are all working with sound, and they're all working with ways of thinking about materials through sound. And by listening, we learn something that we can't learn by just looking. So the exhibition is, in a way, I compose the space for the exhibition. The sound through all six works bleeds into each other, which means it crosses into each other. So when you're standing at one work, you can still hear the other works. But what happens is you, draw, you have your attention drawn to the work that you're focused on. And you listen to that whilst hearing all the sounds. And by doing that, by composing the space, the work, the show as a whole becomes singular work. By having sound in exhibitions, we feel the works differently. We're not just looking at them from a distance, but we're actually immersed inside the work. And that doesn't require volume. This is a really quiet show in a lot of ways. There's lots of small sounds. But by listening to the works, we are uh, engaged in other senses, our body's engaged, we walk through the pieces in a way that you can't do with a painting. Yeah. So that, um, that show actually um, has been uh, touring Australia since, uh, since 2017 um, and it's just having its final um, this weekend is the final weekend for it. So it's quite amazing how, um, I mean, I've had to do a few repairs, but those turntables are still going. Um, there's a list of artists um, down there. So Peter Blamey is really uh, amazing. He was the artist who was using the solar panels and the light bulb um, to perform with. And Pierre Van Gelder is um, the artist who did the weaving work. And they, um, I mean, they're all great. Art. And Ross Manning, um, you saw his work in, in the beginning uh, with the performance. Um, and they're all really um, fabulous, um, yeah, artists and performers. Um, so you could, um, maybe I can put them in the chat later. Um, so that, you know, that was, um, oh, interesting there we go um yeah so i sort of gather together and the work um usually when i install a work like this i um i have all the components and i just sort of build it as i go along um but because this was a touring show it became um uh it became i had to sort of um have these as set pieces um but every time it was shown it was slightly um a slightly variation um, of um, where things were positioned. Um. So you get the sense um, of it as a um, is it, it's a very kind of active um, active installation um, with the movement of the work. Um, this is it where it is currently. They've um, taken a couple of pieces out because the space isn't as big. Um, but yeah, that's its final final resting place. It's arriving um, back here in in crates next week. So. Um, I said to Kate, we'll have to be, do I have to have another, another, um, uh, yeah, another project. Um, while we were doing um, material sound, um, we ended up um, doing, um, Caleb um, was working 
and doing some research around Black Mountain College, um, which is in North, uh, was in North Carolina in Asheville. Um, many of you all know what Black Mountain College is, but um, it was an art school that was started in um, 1933. Um, and it was based on the John Dewey system of education, um, where it was very much sort of student led, um, uh, integrated learning, very um, collaborative and cross disciplinary. Um, I always like showing my students um, this image because this building, which was built in 1940, um, the students built this building. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine students now building their own um, their own art school. But um, and they uh, spent um, two years raising funds so they could build it. Um, and that was it. Really sums up the ethos of the school. Um, so you know, John Cage was there. Uh, Joseph and Annie Albers, uh, Buxminster Fuller. Um, so some at Rauschenberg. So there's some really um, key artists that went through Black Mountain College. Um, and the way, particularly for me, I really like the way that they integrate that sort of craft and craft techniques and um, what was perceived as higher a fine art. Um, and they just did it in a way that was really um, critiquing the process of learning um, in the sort of hierarchies of art in a really interesting way. Um, so we, Black Mountain College closed in 1953, um, but there is a, a, a museum and art center in Asheville um, that we, so I'm so sorry about this image, um, <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, so we were able to go and sort of play with their archive and um, and sort of make a sound show that sort of spoke to the, I guess, the spirit of Black Mountain College in terms of the cross-disciplinary practice and um, uh, craft, you know, I've sort of craft techniques um, and experimental sound. Um, so that I made this work, um, I think I have a better image. Um, in the, in the background, incidentally, is John Cage's piano um, and his on the wall is his prepared uh, a chart for one of his prepared piano performances. And um, I got to I got to prepare the piano with a John Cage expert, which was pretty special. And then uh, in the background of that one, that's Annie Albers. Um, and I got to go on Ab uh, Annie Albers' loom. <laughs> it was like nerding out for um, for two weeks, um, because also Asheville is the um, uh, the home of Moog um, synthesizers. So the the Moog synthesizer factory is there as well. So I, we got to go uh, to the Moog factory and the Moog museum. So it was fabulous. But anyway, I ended up making um, this work with robot vacuum cleaners, um, and I sort of modified them so they um, as they were. Um, going around, I sort of modified them so they weren't vacuum cleaning anymore. <laughs> they were just sort of robot entities and they were hitting these chimes um, in the space. Um, and I've got a remake, I, I came back to Sydney and sort of remade it um, here. So they, um, the idea I was thinking about in this work was that idea that we are immersed in technology and that I guess the there's a really complex uh, relationship it, the work is called work play work slash play which has um, become a really um, I guess a, a really a theme that I explored and in, in my latest show that um, I had was called work play um, and I'm really interested in this in the way that um, it's really ambiguous who is working for who in the world that we're in. Um, so, you know, when um, Amazon bought the biggest um, vacuum robot vacuum cleaner company in the world, the first thing they did was through tracking data, uh, tracking capabilities into the machine. So you've got this kind of 
machine that's working for you, but you are working for it and it's lulling you by the sound of the chimes. Um, and the funny thing about this work is people stare at it for hours and it, you know, they'll, they'll spend 20 minutes looking at a vacuum cleaner. And I think that's kind of interesting as well. Um, this particular show was called Foyer and um, I wanted to, I made these freezes in the back uh, background because I wanted it to feel like a strange, maybe foyer for a, a hotel or a corporation or some kind of um, uh, undefined space. Um, so that's it there. And then this is um, its current form. Uh, which I made for um, for the um, Blue Mountains Cultural Show, um, where I made these um, the fence. I made I wanted to make them sort of look like a village or a house around the bottom, um, and I upscaled um, the work, and I sort of put two um, two of the vacuum cleaners in, um, so they're also sort of fighting and speaking to each other um, when they go around. And then the chimes are made out of um, lead light window techniques, um, sort of manipulated copper. And I use a lot of this um, black um, clay. It's a stoneware. Um, and when you um, fire it in really high temperatures, it goes this really black volcanic um, look. And it's a um, it's a, a clay I really um, I really love. It's very robust. So um, uh, I'll just go back to yeah this one. Um, yeah, there's a black circle up there of it. So it's actually really strong. It has a lot of structural integrity. So you can um, yeah have quite a lot of weight hanging off it. Um, it's kind of a clay for dummies um, because it 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 it's really hard to mess it up in the kiln. Um, so I was, um, it's a up close bell. You can see the, the sort of volcanic, it's got foot spar in it, which is gives it the white um, flakes. Um, but this is a quick video. I think um, they, um, the f sort of funny thing with them is that they they don't hit the chimes that often. I mean, quite often they miss the chimes. So there's that also that sort of funny tension. I think that's sort of why people look at it for quite a long time because they're sort of, you're waiting for it to, to hit, um, uh, hit the chime. So there's this sort of, I don't know, there's a sort of tension in the work. Um, between, yeah, um, wanting them to to sort of work uh, and then them kind of not really working. Um, so it's, yeah. Anyway, um, and I think it really relates to um, these works. So this is the re the latest remake of um, the Man Machine works. Um, so I decided to do a pair of them, um, and because I think they kind of. Uh, I like how they rock out of uh, out of sync with each other when they're going um, back and forth. Um, and I made I sort of um, I wanted to to sort of make them more look like mid-century furniture. Um, so I sort of worked with a cabinet maker because my skills are not uh, not as good as that um, to to make something that was more um, refined and spoke to a kind of mid-century. Um, aesthetic um, within the work um, and I sort of yeah they look a bit more bougie than they did before and then this is the remake of the um, of the spinning wheel which um, I motorized um, using a barbecue rotisserie motor and a wheel of a trolley um, I think I've got a So they, um, 
Yeah, I think uh, that one's playing um, Me Network, uh, classic Australian um, band, Aussie rock band, um, as it goes. So yeah, thinking through that, that kind of work play where there's a sort of shift between these two works that are sort of this analog crafted, um, speaking to their kind of history and their time. And then the, um, I guess the resituated uh, idea of work play within the post digital age of the vacuum cleaners. So this whole show um, kind of, as you walked around, you had these different, um, I guess, different ways of um, speaking to that work play. Um, uh, yeah, I, they're not opposites, but um, those complexities, I guess, of work play. Um, and then uh, the, the other kind of area, I guess, that's returning to a little bit of the sound forest is, um, is this work, which is called, which was also in the exhibition um, and I, I showed earlier in the year, um, this one's made this year, um, and it's called Severed from Ecology. Um, and I sort of wanted to, I guess, um, think about uh, how how we've sort of built these structures that uh, we, make us very disconnected um, from from e e ecologies. Um, and I mean, there's I mean, there's a lot of writing around this at the moment, I guess. Um, and you know, I guess it's sort of connected to the idea that we are in the age of of an extinction, um, and that 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 age is from 1949 when plastics um, came in um, there's a layer of ecology of plastics um, and I sort of wanted to think about that in the I guess the kind of um, the way it connects um, that how we're connected to um, you know out of space this land here and um, the dirt so I, I sort of wanted to have a, a bit of a sort of planetary feel I guess um, within the work um, that's it set up in a in a different gallery earlier in the year um, and these are made out of paper um, that was, one's copper but that's um, like a recycled um, brown paper um, and it's just got a a sort of a um it's a like a gold leaf powder and a um graphite powder on, on it um and that it's a lead light window technique but i've put it into paper um so in the bottom of this work are these funny um ice cube um things that are full of dirt um and growing plants um, and I was experimenting with making earth batteries um, with them. And um, so as the fan is blowing, it's hitting the chimes and playing the chimes with the fan. Um, I had a lot of, um, I've got a lot of friends that are um, really into making electronics and they, they was like, how, how are you getting that earth battery to run the fan? Because really in real life um the earth battery will only run i can get it to run a tiny led light um but not power a fan um so underneath them is um the battery for mobile phone so it's a complete um fabrication and hoax um so they don't work at all as earth batteries um which um i think is um particularly because of where I live in Australia and their utter um, inability to uh, own up to um, their emissions. I think that it kind of <laughs> speaks to that sort of um, falsehood that it is in a lot of, um, uh, a lot of climate um, policy. So I sort of um, thinking that looking forward the the next work I'm working on at the moment for an exhibition, which is um, called underground so it's all about um yeah the the earth um is i'm trying to make kind of large scale um 
uh, earth batteries um, too. So hopefully, I well, well, I might be able to power a fan, but if I can't, um, I just bought a fake Geiger counter. It's a really cool. Um, I, I have a real one, but the fake one is, um, there's something intriguing about it. So I might put those two things together um, as well. Um, but this this idea, I guess, of um, it's really interesting. This I was talking earlier about this kind of material turn. Um, so the this show here was called Promise the Earth, um, and then I was in another show called Inland Sea, and then um, you know the the so this this there's just been an explosion, I guess, of this idea of working with materials and thinking about ecologies and um the complexity of that um is i think it's an interesting area to work in at the moment um and there's certainly a lot of curators out there um yeah working uh to these themes um yeah which is i think quite interesting um and i, I think caleb's kelly's next book is um uh, about sound and ecologies um so I think I have a video of this. Um, oh, and it's also got um, CD players and things in that. That's it there. Oh, there's a, um, um, uh, a part of the essay. So Naomi Riddle actually is a really fam fabulous um, writer. She doesn't just write about sound art, but um, she writes a lot about um, kind of uh, ecologies and um, in, in, in particular in, in in writing about writing um but it does have here a movement uh partially generated by the energy of an earth battery so um it's not really <laughs> living up to that um i thought i'll um maybe finish up finish up with the a, a video of the whole space so this is the whole space um that i've inhabited i haven't there's a lot of works that I haven't um, talked about because, and some of them are not sound works, um, but I thought I'd just sort of stick with the um, the kind of journey that I've just gone on. Um, but I'll play this final video and then I'm not sure how I'm going for time, but maybe we can uh, take some questions. Yeah, so so that's uh, that's uh, my talk. Um, uh, um, I can take some questions. I don't know if Mark, if you want to, um, yeah, take over. I, Did you want me to stop sharing my screen or leave it? Um, maybe leave it up. Yeah, maybe leave it. It's quite nice to see yeah. it, isn't it? Um, yeah. As we go, but um, firstly, oh. thank you, Vicky. That was really amazing nice. and um, really nice, kind of like deep deep dive into everything and. Um, such a vibrant, brilliant practice. So many things at play. I, I love it. Um, we'll go. I'll go through some of the chat things first. There's some yeah, questions and some sure. comments, and then um, and then I've got heaps of stuff, and other people may sure. throw more questions in. So, um, yeah, I was struck by this quote right at the start: "Sound is as much in the dirt as it is in the air." I love that, and um, yeah. yeah, got got kind of interesting. Um, 
response. Um, I think Simon asked, um, or Simon made a comment about um, many stations um, have an automatic backup tape that kicks in if there is dead air. This is in relation to the first piece yeah, for a certain first, amount of time. Yeah, they yeah. did. Uh, I don't think 2SEO was pretty, it's not anymore actually, it's a really quite a, um, well, it's not commercial, but it's quite a sophisticated radio station. But when we were there, it, um, it, I, I can't remember anything kicking in. But mm -hmm. it was usually when the signal, um, like we would have signals, but there would be no sound. So mm -hmm. that wouldn't kick in because we, we were still broadcasting, but not if that makes any sense, um, yeah, because, it, yeah. because we still had the signals. So, but um, yeah, it was a really fun space to play in that having mm -hmm. some, um, we actually, the time got shifted to 11, um, to an earlier time of 11 and we just didn't, it fell apart. I, I, it only worked at, to, you know, like one o'clock in the morning, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> Simon also commented about the tape as well. Is is that tape shredded? Um, Which one there? I think the, I, I believe that was on the very oh, first yeah. thing you showed. First I think one. it was. There's the I've got, tape. I just got to on say there. one thing, Vicky. There's a there's an alarm going off in the building at the moment, which yeah, okay. may, might might mean we have to evacuate. You have to go. I, we'll we'll see. We'll okay, see. I can hear it. That okay. one? No. Oh, no. um simon do you know are you there simon maybe you could hello yeah hello hi there thank you so much for that talk it was brilliant yeah no, you were just on it's... it it was the one that looks like hair hanging off oh yeah yeah so it's just i just cut the tapes yeah and then threaded them through a, a sort of a disc with holes in them um so it's kind of like yeah it's just cut up cassette tape basically so it doesn't make uh, I mean, it kind of makes a sound because I make it I made it shake I don't have a video I love it, I um, love that I love that yeah. You, yeah that movement is even more interesting than the other sound yeah. I can imagine yeah. it rustling and, yeah, yeah it slightly rustles and kind of because it's shiny as well it's sort of it's sort of yeah it shifts the light across it shifts yeah yeah it's so, beautiful thank you thanks <laughs> thanks that's amazing. Um, I'm just gonna fine. Just pause. Just pause. Pause for one second. Eka, are sure. you are you there? Are you? Can you hear this alarm as well? Because I'm in a sort of strange place and it, I can hear it, but it's not really really loud. There is an alarm going. Oh okay. yeah, no. no. Um, yeah. That's I'm your gonna, cue. I'm gonna go outside and just leave this running. Okay. Okay. I think we're all. All right. Sorry. I'm gonna mute okay, myself sorry. again. Yeah. Okay, um, Vicky, I have to yeah. apologise. We, no, that's I'm, fine. We, we're going to have to leave the building, and um, yeah, there's there's obviously questions around playfulness and humour. I had so many questions. Oh, sorry, that's me. Sorry. Sorry. I'll let you guys go because yeah. I, in case, okay. but that's okay. I can. Uh, why don't you send? I can always. Um, Send me the questions and I can yeah. always write write the write responses. Um, That's a nice sure. idea. Let me do, um, let me just take a picture of some of these. I'm trying to download it, but um save the chat. Maybe okay. I can. I've All saved right. I've, I've saved the chat and um, I think we're gonna have to go because all sorts of things get, happen. Get out so of sorry. Yes. Sirens now. Get out, yeah. get out. Okay. See you Mark. Vicky, thank you very Good much. Bit. Thank you thank so you. much. Bye. Thank brilliant. you. Take take thank care you. everyone. Bye -bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye, Vicky. Thanks again. That was amazing. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> yeah, get some rest. <laughs>